Well, um, it is 12 noon in the UK and time for our webinar to begin. Friends, colleagues, experts, welcome to this session entitled Mental Health and Wellbeing in the Climate Emergency, Global Perspectives and Calls to Action. I'm Marla Rao, a public health academic from Imperial College London, involved with climate and health research and advocacy for several decades. Recently, I had the privilege of being invited to guest edit a special issue of the International Review of Psychiatry on the Climate Crisis and Mental Health. On 27 September, just over a month ago, many of the distinguished experts who had contributed to the issue joined me in launching it and participated in a webinar discussion to highlight the many dimensions of the climate crisis and mental health link, which we have explored in the special edition. You may be interested in reading some of the papers and I'm requesting my colleague, Dr. Neil Jennings to upload the web link to the issue in the chat box for your information. Now against that background, today's webinar uh, at this Planetary Health Alliance meeting offers an opportunity to continue that discussion with a few of our authors and with you, the participants at this event. So do please send us your comments, feedback and questions through the chat function. And depending on how many questions we receive, we're going to try and put as many of those as we can to our panelists during the next hour. This event is taking place at a time when climate scientists inform us that the crisis has reached a bleak moment and the data they've collected has laid bare how close we are to a catastrophe. Even the most renowned scientists have acknowledged how very worried they are and this is compounded by the uncertainties as to whether our global political leaders use the opportunity of the forthcoming COP27 climate summit to take decisive action. So how is the crisis affecting mental health and well-being and why does that matter? To summarize the exhaustive evidence which she and her colleagues put together in their review, I believe the most comprehensive review to date of the impacts of climate change on mental health and emotional well-being, I invite my colleague Emma Lawrence to take the floor. In the interest of time, I'm going to introduce our speakers only briefly but you will find their name, title, and affiliation on the screen while they're speaking. So over to you, Emma. Many thanks, Marla. So if we can go to the next slide, please, Jack. Um, I'm here today to sort of summarize the evidence that we presented in our narrative review as part of the special issue on how the climate emergency is a mental health and well-being emergency. Um, because of numerous interconnected causes and consequences. So as Marla described, climate change has been um, lauded as a, uh, a health emergency and we, it threatens the health and well-being of people around the world. But the mental health um, part of that has been underappreciated to date. So if you go to the next slide. Mental health research uh, and practice for decades um, has noted that there are conditions that improve mental health and well-being, and conditions that worsen mental health and well-being. And the Lancet Commission on Global Mental Health and Sustainable Development noted that we de desperately need to create an environment that fosters mental health and well-being for all. However, the climate crisis gravely threatens this vision. Next slide. So climate change through changes to temperature, sea level rise, and more acute extreme and uh, weather and climate events such as floods, fires, and droughts is increasingly, and as we're seeing globally, leading to a range of um, grave risks for communities around the world. Next slide. So as we've seen in the, in the headlines or experienced ourselves, um, climate change is already leading to loss and damages of homes and properties and direct experience of very high temperatures. Um, and we saw that even in the UK this year. But these uh, effects lead to a, a follow on range of, of damage to crops and, and livestock, loss of uh, habitats and livelihoods, breakdown of communities, 
forced migration, disruption to health systems, and this sort of plethora of interconnected um, pathways uh, ultimately leads to worse mental health and well-being, as I'll describe. But it's not only these sort of direct effects, but watching this happen, witnessing this happen, and witnessing the inaction of leaders that can be deeply distressing. If we go to the next slide. So when we talk about mental health and well-being in the context of the climate emergency, we're talking about a huge range of impacts um, for different people and communities. This can be increased cases of suicidal thoughts and deaths by suicide. It can be increased symptoms or new cases of diagnosable mental illness. It can be increased susceptibility to physical ill health or even death for those with diagnosable mental illness. So for example, people with pre-existing mental illness can be um, far more likely to die in a heat wave. We're also seeing worsened population, mental health and well-being, and, and mental and emotional distress, again, through experiencing these grave threats um, or direct uh, traumas, but also through awareness of what's happening and what's to come for ourselves, but also others and nature around the world. And again, the inaction of leaders in the face of the crisis. If we go to the next slide. But uh, as we try and describe in the narrative review, it's not just, you know, we can't look at um, the climate crisis in isolation. And the reason that mental health and well-being is so gravely threatened is because the interconnectedness, you know, our mental health and well-being depends on um, our, our environment and our social connections, our livelihoods, our access to um, safe air to breathe, um, stable food systems, stable water systems. Um, and uh, a security of a safe and livable future. But climate change is interacting with a whole bunch of other crises around the world and massively widening um, existing inequalities, both within and across um, societies and nations. So what we see in the context, for example, of burning fossil fuels is that, which is ultimately the cause of climate change, is that people who live in places where more fossil fuels are burnt, have poorer air quality, they're more likely to die from COVID-19, they're more likely to experience direct effects from um, that air pollution for their mental health, like depression, anxiety, and higher suicide risk, they're more likely to experience physical health problems, and unfortunately they're more likely to be from lower income groups, so this widens um, existing inequalities. And we have to see the connections and the common causes between the challenges that our societies face. If we go to the next slide. And what this means is that climate um, emergency widens inequalities in interconnected ways. And this can look like power imbalances and uh, how um, richer countries continue to extract from um, poorer countries. And this can uh, mirror uh, sort of historical um, inequalities and uh, for example, the impacts of colonization. If we go to the next slide. So we need to understand mental health and well-being in the context of the climate emergency, understanding how health and well-being is um, understood in different cultures and communities. So the uh, Aboriginal Health Council of Western Australia, for example, has said when we talk about mental health impacts of climate change, we're talking about the loss and disconnection of our spiritual identity, our cultural beliefs and our values, which are essential requirements for our own life force. So the health of our communities, planet, and um, as ourselves are intricately linked. If we go to the next slide. So if these are all interconnected um, common causes, that means that there's interconnected solutions. Fundamentally, we're in a race against time to cut our dependence on fossil fuels. And the UNEP report just released has said only an urgent system-wide transformation can deliver the enormous cuts needed to lim limit greenhouse gas emissions and secure a livable future. There is no graver challenge that humans have ever faced. Um, and the IPCC reports has said that in order to have this kind of transformation, we need resilient communities who have the capacity for this kind of transformation. And this fundamentally re relies on social and emotional well-being and resilience, communities who are empowered with the skills and the resources to cope with and act on the grave threats being faced 
So we need to create a transformational shift that centers these kind of cultures of care and what we know from global mental health um, and cultures around the world is good simultaneously for people and the planet. So if we go to the next slide. And what we outline in the narrative review is this type of climate action that we need at all levels to transform our society and protect the social and environmental determinants of good mental health and well-being, while enabling people um, to you know, understand and respond to the way we're thinking and feeling about climate change. And that centers the well-being of all people and the planet and creates a virtuous cycle where people are, are more able to act um, and also systems changes uh, that improve the conditions for good mental health and well-being also secure a safer climate future um, and these are again very interconnected and interdependent at all levels so we encourage you to um, dip into this evidence base but if we can go to the next slide i just want to outline um, before i hand back to marla that because of these common causes and interconnected um, sort of risk multipliers of the climate emergency for mental health and well-being Conversely, climate action is mental health action at all levels, at individuals, communities and systems change. Um, doing things that are good for a safer climate future is good for our mental health and well-being um, and vice versa. The conditions that nourish mental health and well-being um, and care for people is ultimately what will better also care for the planet. So we need to hold this in mind um, as we urgently uh, push for change. Um, that is needed to secure a livable future. I'll hand back to you, Marla. Emma, thank you so much for um, setting the scene so expertly and for leading us nicely to our next presentation. The editorial group, Emma Lawrence, Dr. Neil Jennings, Richard Powell and I were absolutely clear that one of our priorities was to give young people voice, that generation that's uh, going to face the worst impacts of this uh, climate breakdown. And here to represent the global group of young people who came together to share their views, concerns, and hopes in their paper, which is part of the special edition, is Sasha Wright from the organization Force of Nature. Sasha, may I please invite you to describe some of the key points of your paper, please? Yes, thank you, Mala. And it is such a privilege to join my esteemed colleagues today. Um, I am Sasha Wright. As I was introduced, uh, I'm 23 years old and I'm a climate activist from Canada. Um, I'm also a master's candidate at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and I'm the head of research and impact at Force of Nature, which is a youth nonprofit mobilizing mindsets for climate action. This is sort of a fancy way of saying that we exist to speak with other young people around the world who are trying to come to grips with a rapidly changing and frightening future for our planet and critically to create safe spaces for them to open up about these difficult, uncomfortable climate related emotions and channel them into action. So if you'll go to the next slide, please. Um, our paper not about us without us. Uh, it provides a firsthand account of the feelings and hopes of 23 climate concerned young people from 15 countries around the world. And while there is absolutely no way that we could hope to speak for everyone's experience, in fact, I don't think that we should endeavor to, um, we hope to encapsulate a variety of perspectives from young people who are often spoken about, but are not often given the opportunity to speak for themselves in academic contexts. So in this paper, it is the first time young people from so many countries have been able to record their feelings in an academic journal in their own words. And it was very important to us that their lived experience was considered a legitimate form of expertise, um, especially for those young people who bravely shared firsthand accounts of climate related distress and extreme weather events. So we were able to have them all named as co-authors in the paper instead of just contributors. So this paper is personally important to us as the authors for many reasons. Um, and if you choose to read it, it may be emotional for you. Um, and although our authorship came from 15 countries around the world, many different backgrounds, it was remarkable to see how much we had in common in the writing process, both in our feelings of distress about the status quo and the ways we wanted to be supported in those feelings, but also in the ways that we wanted to see society change in the future and what support looked like for us. So at the end of the day, it is a raw account of the understandable grief, despair, and distress that many young people are experiencing in the climate crisis, but it is also 
also a map towards a better future, highlighting the individual mental health support that young people want, um, and also the structural changes that young people want from policymakers to help build compassionate societies more broadly. And you might be thinking, although I hope at this point the answer is clear, um, why should young people be featured in an academic journal? And for those of us, like myself, in bubbles of relative and shrinking climate privilege, it can be easy to switch off from the reality of the situation. And since the mid 20th century, earlier even in fact, it has been clear how good we are at destroying the natural world and how good we are at pretending otherwise. But our generation and my generation is really waking up to the fact that our divorce from nature is an existential threat. So young people are at a unique advantage to facilitate these conversations because we can do three things. We can think outside the incumbent system. We can see obvious barriers and ideate new solutions. We have the greatest cause for commitment to the solutions because we're inheriting the decisions being made today. And we carry a strong sense of moral imperative because we're connected emotionally and generationally to one another. So I want to emphasize that this paper was created to put forth a collaborative and deeply democratic voice curated through a thoroughly, thoroughly co-participatory, co-creative writing process. And I'm simply lucky enough to speak on behalf of my peers. So to demonstrate the above, I've included a number of quotes from the young people who co-authored the paper to highlight the key points in their own words. So if you'll please go to the next slide. So the first one is from Damien Juma, and he said, when I was growing up, there was enough water, although not safe drinking water, uh, but one could purify. Now the streams are dry, and there's neither enough nor safe water. And if other species disappear, so do we. So climate action is an act of love. Next slide, please. This one is from Ayumide Roju. And she said, I would like for people to understand climate anxiety or my fear of eco degradation is not a fad. They are very real emotions to me. The government and older generations must listen to and include young people in decision making process. Next slide, please. Hope Lekwa said, people may support folks who express their climate related feelings, firstly, by not labeling them as weirdos. The gravity of climate change has given everyone the right to express themselves and no one should be ashamed of doing so. And finally, last slide. This is a piece of art that Tupelo created after contributing to the writing process to illustrate a broken open heart and how you can carry grief and fear at the same time as hope and optimism in the face of the climate crisis. So to cap it off, in this paper, um, we speak to a number of areas, including our specific feelings and mental health amidst climate change's impacts and climate inaction, including the similarities and differences across our backgrounds. Um, we discuss the disruption caused by our climate-related feelings, what helps us cope, validating responses, support from mental health professionals, and then we end by really elucidating what we hope for, which is a radically more compassionate world, including critically climate action from policymakers and business leaders. Um, like most people from older generations, we want a better world for our families, our peers, and our kids. And we hope that this paper raises awareness about the mental health impacts of continued climate inaction, normalizes healthy concerns about the state of the world, um, and also inspires people to imagine a better future that we could be working towards together. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sasha, for that incredibly sobering account. Now, as highlighted by Emma, we have a more accurate picture of the physical health impacts of climate change and mental health has so far received scant attention. And not only do we have a major gap in our understanding of the mental health impacts, that evidence gap is perhaps the greatest in those countries where the climate crisis is exacting the highest toll. And representing some of those geographies are Dr. John Jamir Benzonaruta and Professor Monica de Santos, who are here to enlighten us on the situation in the Philippines and in the African context. So John, may I invite you to tell us about the Philippines and Monica, may I request you to follow on with some observations about Africa, please. Thank you very much, Mala, for the opportunity to speak at this event. I'm here to summarize our paper that talks about the role of mental health professionals in the Philippines to address mental health consequences of climate change on Filipinos. But first, let me bring you to our context in the Philippines. 
Just two days ago, Typhoon Nalge, locally known as Paeng, directly hit the Philippines, including the village where my family resides, bringing severe floods and loss of electricity and water supply. Other regions in the country were also directly affected, killing many people through flash floods and landslides, damaging homes and multi-million cost on livelihoods. In fact, as, as we speak today, many Filipinos may be experiencing the grief, loss, and trauma caused by the typhoon. But as they recover from the damages of the typhoon that hit them two days ago, another typhoon is coming, which can hit tonight or tomorrow. But this is not uncommon in the Philippines. The Philippines faces at least 20 typhoons per year, some of which are super typhoons due to climate change. Estimates show that an average Filipino will face around 1,500 typhoons within his or her lifetime. One can only imagine the psychological impact of these increasingly intensified typhoons on the mental health of the Filipino youth because they are the ones who will face the brunt of climate change. Our paper detailed the role of mental health professionals to address climate change, increasing mental health impacts on Filipinos, especially the youth. The first global survey of climate anxiety, for example, showed that the Filipino youth is the most climate anxious in the world. Since the world is unfortunately not on track to meeting the net zero goals in 2050, more young Filipinos might face mental health consequences of climate change in the future. Our paper makes a call emphasizing that the country's community of mental health workers must embrace climate change as part of its healing mission and step up its efforts to respond to the emerging mental health needs brought about by the climate crisis. Fortunately, there are many good things happening so far. For example, recently, the National Conference of the Psychological Association of the Philippines had a theme of climate change and mental health. Additionally, the Psychological Association of the Philippines junior affiliates, these are undergraduate students in psychology, has recently been including climate change in the work, workshops for undergraduate students, making sure that future psychologists in the country are aware of the nexus between climate change, mental health, and human behavior. Similar steps are taken by other professional organizations in the field of medicine and psychiatry in the country. And to me, this is an important step in increasing awareness among mental health and allied professionals in the country. In my opinion, the next step must be equipping mental health providers with the skills in addressing mental health concerns related to climate change, which requires systemic changes in how we train mental health providers in the country. The goal is to harness the youth's emotions about climate change to spark climate action and justice. In achieving this goal, mental health providers in the country must take the opportunity to broaden their perspectives and incorporate climate change in their conceptualization of mental health. Mental health providers are a piece of the puzzle in addressing climate change and its impact on our people and planet. Thank you very much. Um, good day. So, Marla, are you going to speak first? Or? Okay, um, good day everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to represent Africa and um, the African context. So I'm going to start off just by um, showing and very briefly discussing a, a few um, cartographs, which I think contextualize Africa within the global context well. So if we look at CO2 emissions, you'll see that Africa is a little green spot in the middle. And um, you'll see that Africa contributes relatively little um, in terms of CO2, CO2 emissions globally. Um, moving on to the next slide, if we look at inequality, um, Africa is regarded to be the most unequal continent globally. Um, next slide. If we look at the HIV prevalence, sub-Sahara and Africa in general, we'll, you'll see that we have you know, a huge HIV problem, particularly in sub-Sahara. And the next slide shows um, how we're lacking in healthcare providers, and that, in, that would include um, mental healthcare practitioners. I will discuss it a little bit 
in greater detail. And the last slide um, is the unhappy or the happy index. And um, we take everything into context of, of what I've, what's been shown uh, prior to this slide, you'll see that Africa is um, regarded and uh, regarded to be probably the most unhappy continent, the South Africa particularly unhappy. Um, but thank you, I'm going to now discuss a little bit about uh, the, the, the um, commentary that was published regarding this. So um, the first slide I showed you showed the CO2 emissions. So if you look at the global south, um, including Africa, they contributed relatively little um, to, the, to the context of, um, sorry, my slides have now suddenly gone very small. So I'm just trying to increase it. I'm not sure how to. I'll have to start it again, sorry. So if you look at CO2 emissions, um, South Africa, Africa has, has contributed very little to, to the global situation. And um, it's predicted that Africa will um, be double whatever the global temperature rise is, uh, the pre-industrial era. So if you're looking at globally 2%, um, it's, it's anticipated that Africa will be uh, double that amount. I just need to restart this. Okay. Okay, if you look at the INDC and the IPCC reports, um, sorry, yes, so that contextualizes the, 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 it's the, it's the ICC reports that predict Africa's situation in terms of double the global average. Most communities in sub saharan Africa are regarded to be ecologically sensitive. Um, and what Emma said in the first presentation regarding mental health um, is applicable also to Africa. Impacts can be explicit or implicit in either short-term or long-term, um, resulting in traumatic stress and other chronic psychopathological and psychiatric patterns. Um, these can also include anxiety, depression, trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, and suicide. However, as Marla indicated in her opening, an em empirical research is still lacking in the area. Individuals with pre-existing health or, or mental health conditions may be more exposed or vulnerable to these um, changes. And, and uh, a previous study also suggests that a falling temperature or extreme heat exposure can lead to heightened aggression um, in vulnerable populations. Um, based on the few studies that are available within the African context, it's also evident that the health system in general is ill-prepared for the added pressure of climate change. Um, within the South African context, for example, um, medical pr practitioners, about 70% of them work privately, leaving fewer than 11,000 practitioners to attend to the majority of the population which only have access to state um, assistance. Uh, there's a mean of 13 medical doctors and two specialist doctors available per 100,000 people in the country's rural settings. So these inequalities are intensified when medical access is more challenging and expensive and when transportation expenses are high. But in the African setting, um, we're looking at many imposing challenges, such as an increase in disease burden, such as HIV AIDS and um, the associated neurocognitive disorders associated with that, water and food insecurity, the ramifications of colonization, resultant inequality, economic and geopolitical stresses, and these all ultimately converge with climate change. It is also likely that a syndemic relationship between the HIV ep epidemic and in environmental degradation exists, however, and existing evidence base is also still lacking in this area. And just how to address these aspects. Um, we've seen, and, and the COVID ep epidemic highlighted this, um, that the fourth industrial revolution can play a significant role. Um, if we're looking, for example, at telemedicine, however, in some of the rural settings in Africa, the right infrastructure is still um, not in place. We also need to look at um, complex adaptive integrated research concerning how climate change impacts on mental health and health in general. And lastly, um, policymakers need to be preemptive in sourcing and enhancing processes and practices to render mental health disaster preparedness uh, intervention and services equipped for climate change. Thank you very much.
<clears throat> Monica and John, thank you so much for that very powerful description and, and for sharing a glimpse of uh, what's happening in your, in your regions. So now our final panelist is Dr. Ching Lee, a UK-based consultant psychiatrist who's been reflecting with a number of her colleague mental health professionals on what their role needs to be going forward. And so Ching, may I ask you to explain to us your call to action and how you suggest mental health professionals, but also the public could unite to act on this agenda and be that transformational force uh, which Emma and all the previous speakers have um, have have uh, uh, spoken about. So over to you, Ching. Great, thank you very much, Marla, and nice to meet everyone. So as you said, my name is Dr. Ching Li, and I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and also a member of the Royal College of Psychiatry's Sustainability Committee in the UK. And so in terms of my paper, one key message from this paper is that not only do we need to highlight the significant mental health burden and emotional distress that will be caused by the climate and ecological crisis, both now and in the future, we also need to understand that these psychological and emotional responses lie on a continuum with trauma and anxiety on one end and denial, avoidance and indifference on the other. And that it is these latter responses that are more concerning and unfortunately for me in the UK more prevalent as we mostly live in societies that still remain collectively dissociated from the reality of things. So whilst we need to highlight and support the mental health consequences of the climate crisis, it goes without saying that it's crucial not to pathologize individual suffering. We need to understand these experiences as valid, rational, and often adaptive responses in those who are trying to engage with the reality of our collective predicament and who are concerned by the lack of proportionate, coordinated responses for tackling the issue on a macro level. There are powerful cultural assumptions, commercial and political interests that create structures of inaction, which help to maintain what can be understood as a state of societal dissociation. Another element at this intersection of climate change and mental health is understanding that the climate crisis is not only a socioeconomic or political problem, it is a psychological one. For anyone working in this field, we know that this is an area that is not only global, but deeply personal and emotional. All of us working in this field can recognize the emotional weight that comes with facing up to the reality of the climate crisis and how easily one can tip over from action and motivation to feelings of overwhelm and powerlessness. So in order to bring about change, we also need to be able to support the processing of difficult experiences and emotions. We need to promote ongoing engagement when it feels easier to turn away. And we need to take these difficult feelings, such as anxiety and overwhelm, and funnel them into collective action. What's more, at the intersection of climate and health, this is also an opportunity to transform our healthcare systems. In order to make more sustainable healthcare systems, we need to move beyond minimal definitions of reaching net zero to a broader framework of sustainable healthcare that prioritizes prevention. We need to minimize the burden of chronic disease and pharmacological treatments and promote patient-centered care in order to encourage self-management and promote staff well-being in order to foster organizational resilience. So seen from this perspective, sustainable healthcare, which has the lowest impact on the planet, is also simply better healthcare. So our rallying call for health professionals is as follows. We need to implore all of those working in the health sector to recognize that the climate emergency is the defining public health emergency of our time. We need to move beyond minimal definitions of sustainability in order to advocate for the key determinants and health and well-being on a global level. Furthermore, when these threats are perpetuated by systemic failures that fail to bring adequate change, it also becomes our responsibility of the health sector in the health sector to hold key organizations and governments to account for the structural changes that are so urgently needed. So finally, I'll end with some key take-home messages. Firstly, 
it's important to recognize that there is no one size fits all here. The most appropriate action to individuals or groups of professionals will depend on their existing skills, strengths and situation. There is a need for diverse approaches to this problem. Secondly, it's about using one's professional role as a trusted public figure within society, be it academic, scientist, policymaker, or clinician, we need to use our professional credibility to promote and amplify this issue wherever possible. Thirdly, we need to help professionals understand that this is a shift in thinking and an opportunity to imagine a better model of healthcare. And finally, it's about urging people not to feel alone, but to join the platforms and networks that are already out there so that they can get involved in collective action. This coming together can create sharing, connection, and a sense of community, which can help to support the difficult emotions engendered by this work, which can in turn sustain motivation and hope that we can bring about change. Thank you. King, thank you so much for that. Thank you all uh, for giving our attendees an excellent flavor of what was included in the special issue. And now it's time for some questions. As you know, we invited you, the attendees, to send us some questions at the time you registered to attend the event. And we picked a few of those questions to put to our experts on the panel, um, yeah, you know, and, and then we'll take some more from the, from the chat box. So uh, in this lead up to COP27 with the scientific reports becoming more grim by the day, climate anxiety is uh, escalating steeply. A recent protests in the U UK and elsewhere illustrate just how deeply anxious people are, especially the young. So may I turn to you, Sasha, um, to, to, to and, and, and ask how are young people mobilizing themselves in the way that Ching has uh, you know, talked about to tackle their climate anxiety, particularly in this run up to COP27? Yeah, and and can we all be question. brief and then we can try to squeeze in as many questions as we possibly can? Yes, I will try to keep it brief. Um, and also because I think that it's really important that um, the way that people take action, the way that people respond is uh, different across different individuals and communities, and each will kind of self-define how the climate crisis influences their mental health and well-being. Um, you mentioned something really important, which is mobilization. And one thing that I think is really important to emphasize is the role of this action taking in alleviating climate related distress. So this doesn't just look like recycling or using a paper straw, but this is action taking that is participatory, transformational, involves community based and you know participatory action and critically it is action taking that is met with similar pace scale and urgency from people in decision making positions which is something that we have historically not seen at cop um, it harkens to something that emma said earlier which is that climate action is in fact a determinant of our mental health which in turn is a determinant of how we take action on the climate so really to put it in plain terms for young people um, broadly i think it's difficult to be happy when we know that we're inheriting a burning world or when that is the information that we're waking up to each and every day and to turn off from that feels somewhat irresponsible but to lean into it feels uh, you know deeply um hurtful so in the lead up to COP27, activism is really ramping up, you know, calls are becoming more desperate and urgent. And I think it's essential that young people's mental health is validated and safeguarded, and that their voices are validated and safeguarded, and that their experiences are centered. So climate anxiety is that critical catalyst for climate action, and these emotions are rational and they're healthy, but they're also deeply, deeply uncomfortable and frightening. So they need to be taken collectively and collaboratively, and they must be seen as evidence that this is the defining issue of our time and we know it. Um, so just to kind of cap it off, I think currently we know that the most ardent voices for climate action are coming from those countries and those spaces that are most disproportionately affected by the climate crisis and who also contribute the absolute least to it globally. So these communities and the young people within them, they, these communities have also shouldered the work of developing the most sophisticated coping methods and tools for resilience um, and are at the forefront of climate action. So to answer your question, I think COP27 is really bringing attention to this action, but year, year round, we have to create avenues and conduits for channeling these climate related emotions into action. Um, really taking our examples from the courageous young people who are mobilizing on mass around the world, um, who are really taking up the helm of the land defenders who have fought for our planet for years. 
Thank you. Tasha, thank you. Um, Monica, same question to you. Um, um, you know, leading on from what Sasha was saying, how are people reacting to the current news? Uh, you know, in 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 the in in South Africa, um, because you know there, there's a, there's an assumption that um, uh, climate anxiety is is generally experienced by the privileged. And how are people uh, uh, in in the global south who are already facing the dual burdens of the uh, socioeconomic challenges and uncertainties mm. which define their daily lives and the worst burdens of climate disasters how are they experiencing this and what what how does anxiety climate anxiety mm. manifest itself and what does it look like in south africa please i think you're right in saying that it's um more the the upper economic group that's aware of, of or sensitized towards climate change. Um, I think I think at a grassroots level and at a, at a you know in your poverty areas, there's so many competing demands um, that there isn't really sufficient awareness of, of of climate change or really that it's impacting current current situations. Although the recent fairly recent floods in KwaZulu Natal and Durban was was attributed to climate change. So I think that that sensitivity and awareness is growing. But yes, we have a lot of competing challenges. And um, the, the positive part is that the South African government has never been in denial about the climate situation and is looking at strategies and implementing national strategies of, of how to synchronize our, our newly or to, to be uh, rolled out NHR, which is the National Health Insurance Scheme that it synchronizes with climate change strategies. Um, so yes, uh, the, the political will is there. Sorry. Uh, yes, thank you very much for that, Monica. Um, <clears throat> so then moving on to the question of mental health professionals and what they do globally, there's a there's a, an interesting question that's come in here. John, you were talking about how you're mobilizing yourselves in, in the Philippines, but it's largely at the mental health professional uh, level. I mean, how are they then linking rapidly with the public in order to scale up and ensure a nationwide availability of, of uh, measures to uh, uh, you know, to build that resilience within communities. And so here we have a question. How do the authors feel our traditional therapeutic practices um, have to adapt or change in order to meet the mental health and well-being needs caused by the climate emergency? So, you know, at, at that sort of uh, front line, how would you respond to that question, John? And then I'd, I'd, I'd love you, Ching, to come in and 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 tell us, you know, how you're how you're answering that question at a practical level here in the UK. John first, please. Thank you for the question, Mala. I think when we create interventions uh, in addressing the mental health impacts of climate change, it's very important that we look at how people experience climate emotions within their context. And of course, it's very easy for us to say that climate anxiety can all can spark climate action. But what we're seeing in the recent data, for example, this uh, paper published in the Journal of Environmental Psychology, which involved 32 countries, which in includes the Philippines, it says that uh, climate anxiety does not spark climate action among Filipinos. Okay, and another interesting part of this is that climate anxiety only sparks pro-environmental behavior and climate actions among people in Western countries. But that pattern is not observed in people in non-Western countries. So the message here is if we are creating interventions for climate emotions and mental health consequences of climate change and how can we translate that into climate action, it's very important that we look at the nuances of these emotions within their context, how people experience these emotions and how and what other factors aside from uh, climate emotions can spark climate action. This is also related to the questions I'm seeing in the chat box on 
the importance of traditional views in understanding climate emotions. And I think, you know, uh, having a more nuanced understanding, you know, is very important. This is a very active area of research and more, more, more studies are needed, I would have to say. That's really interesting. So over to you, Ching. Thank you, Mala. I mean, I guess the thing that I'm most keen to say is that I'm, I really want to reach out to any mental health professionals and therapists and say that actually, please don't think of this as something new and please don't think of this as something outside of your existing skill set. We need a diversity of approaches. So actually, it's about people bringing the experience and the skills and the frameworks that they have. I think the thing that I would say is that providing we keep a couple of overarching common sense principles in mind, which is we're not here to pathologize individuals and take away the anxiety and say that that is in itself a dysfunction. We have to really understand these symptoms as being a signal to a far more fundamental problem. And we need to help people, as John, you were kind of alluding to, you know, we need to, there's a psychological journey here where anxiety is not enough. We need to help people process these really difficult feelings, get over a desire for paralysis, and actually then, you know, kind of help them produce something meaningful in terms of change. Um, so for me, it's really about not getting rid of the old, but just refashioning it for this particular crisis and problem. Well, thanks, Ching. I mean, in my view, there's also that added um, issue, isn't there, of the hostility that protest or any kind of action uh, ends up uh, creating, as we've seen with some uh, current protests. So, so not only are people anxious and, and protesting against uh, you know, carbon profligate ways of living, but then there is the, the, the uh, you know, the, the, the being discredited and facing those hostilities is an added added problem here, which of course uh, uh, people face. But uh, going on to Monica, you've got a hand raised, Monica. So, so did you want to add something here? I just wanted to um, uh, jump in with indigenous uh, side of the question. I, I think that's a very important factor. Um, we look at the African context, um, the indigenous belief system has always been more holistic compared to, to Western individual individualistic approaches. So I think, you know, with, with the global, from a global perspective, the world has a lot to learn from more holistic perspectives of, of how we have to live in tune with the environment. Well, um, absolutely. In fact, um, you reminded me of a uh, UN Population Fund report. I think this was 2009 where they had a wonderful case study of, of uh, 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 the, one of the islands in the Pacific that was running out of water. And it was uh, ancient tribal knowledge of hydrology, which actually sorted the issue out. And so, the, the, you know, I do sometimes wonder whether uh, there needs to be a mass mobilization of indigenous uh, people to, to, to to, to, you know, um, har harvest that kind of wisdom in order to begin to understand what we mean by restorative uh, 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 ways of, of, uh, of, of living from, from uh, now moving forward. Um, so, we'll, we'll, you know, I'm sure this is, this is going to, this is going to grow uh, as uh, uh, COP27 ends up with an action plan. Now, one specific question that's come through is, you know, a, 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 a participant says, as a coach, I'm keen to support those suffering from eco-anxiety and eco-anger and to connect with those who are in denial. What tools and techniques have you found most helpful in supporting those suffering now and how to open minds that are currently closed? So it, it slightly relates to that business of hostility that I was talking about. So, so what, what techniques and tools, any that you might want to su suggest, um, who'd like to go first, you know, uh, Ching or John? John, I imagine that even in the Philippines, you have people who are in denial. So first, Ching, as you just raised your hand, Ching, and then uh, I'll give you, John, a moment to reflect on whether 
whether something is happening in the Philippines, which may be replicable. I'd just like to say, I mean, first of all, it's absolutely the million dollar question, isn't it? So if we had a simple solution here, then perhaps we wouldn't even be in this problem. But um, a couple of really good organizations I'd like to point uh, Jules towards would be the Good Grief Network and also the Climate Psychology Alliance. So there are you know, very important groups of people doing this kind of thinking. Is that international, Jing? And and uh, or like mental health first aid, is there a move to, you know, uh, globalize techniques that might have been developed in one one part of the world and have been shown to be effective? Is is that happening amongst your professional networks? I think that's a really big question as well, actually. So I would say that unfortunately for me in the UK, a lot of the tools that I come across are kind of, you know, UK, American based. And actually that talks to something, doesn't it, about the inequalities in our kind of global situation. I think that it's important for us to continue that work in order to share resources. And it's actually a massive mapping exercise so that we can get the best out of what's happening globally in terms of people's separate bits of work. Well, thank you, Ching, because, you know, if there are any uh, funders uh, attending our, our discussion today, maybe, maybe they'd take note, because during the pandemic, uh, research funders uh, were very, very quick off the mark, you know, and we're so grateful to them for having done that to help us quickly test out uh, treatments and vaccines and so on and, and, and get these sorts of solutions in place. So perhaps what we need is much more investment to allow you to rapidly test out interventions, decide what works and um, globalize these things. Emma, you wanted to say something and then we'll go on to John. Yeah, thank you very much, Marla. And thanks for all the wonderful questions coming in. So just to say in terms of building on what Ching said of that there is great work happening um, in communities globally, but there's no sort of one space at the moment for people to necessarily find that. So that's something we're really trying to work on at Climate Cares is bringing this together. And we've just done a big sort of scoping of interventions happening around the world. Um, and we can hopefully share some of that, but I'd also love to share like a list of resources with all attendees. Um, so we can do that sort of after the, um, the event. But as uh, has been discussed, it's really important to also understand um, how these needs uh, can be um, different in different cultures, different communities, different contexts. Um, but also some of them, as Sasha described, of the young co-authors are also universal. You know, we're all as individuals, you know, every person in the world is going to have to wrestle with um, the the risks and the and the threats of the climate crisis and the emergency that we're facing and as ching has described you know people respond to that in different ways and a lot of people are also responding with defense mechanisms of denial or dissociation um, and centering and continuing to center practices that uh are uncaring as sally weintraub would say for for people um, and the planet and so what's coming out of the research i guess in the sort of end of people who are overwhelmed and distressed, it's coming understandably from um, people who uh, feel more connection to, to nature, have, are often very empathetic. And so as we've all described, it's important, um, I guess, across all of these techniques, and as the young person's paper says, to just hold space for people to be able to um, have their, their voice heard and, and to talk about. A lot of the interventions are also creating space for people just to talk and share and reflect on what they're feeling, things like climate cafes, Etc. that actually force of nature um, are having a big push on around COP that Sasha could also speak to. But then, you know, the difference between having, so it's understandable and actually, um, you know, it's the people that are sort of paying attention to what's going on who are feeling like the most distressed. So people who are more engaged or have more direct experience we're seeing in the data. So a direct experience of climate change shows you how bad it is. You're obviously more worried for the future. You're more likely to be distressed. Um, but also people who are more engaged um, politically and with the wider world and with the, the climate information are going to be more distressed. So that's, you know, that's not a bad thing. And it is the question of how we awaken people who are feeling um, those more barriers to engagement. Um, but then also it's an ongoing chronic stressor to be exposed to that information 
um, and trying to make change in very difficult circumstances and not seeing the response that we need um, from leaders. So what can protect people's uh, mental health and well-being in the context of being awake to the threats seems to be not feeling powerless and not feeling hopeless. So it is important that we can hold space for the grief and the fear and the despair, but also hold space for hope. And a lot of the interventions are centered around work that's been done over the last decades in how you can um, create space for uh, transformation within yourself, within your life that uh, creates hope through your action, through your connection to others and, and to nature. Um, and so, and also, you know, agency and sense of power. Um, and so that's, again, linked to the discussions that I've been having of, of voices that are not being heard, not being listened to, and how can that really change? And I saw a question in the chat of the difficulty of people and particularly young people feeling like they do have power when they can't vote, for example. Um, and that's why we have to keep fighting um, for activists and to have um, space to have, you know, to, to be doing what they're doing um, so importantly. And so there is no easy answer, but it's really vital that we help people sort of on that journey. And I think that's part of the reason people um, sometimes intellectually care, but don't engage with the crisis fully is that they can't see, they think they're just going to sort of sink down into a hole and that's going to be it. So I think it's also important to note that the good things that can come with engagement and, and the sense of meaning, the sense of purpose, that there is a sort of journey people can go on um, for want of a better term, where actually to allow yourself to feel these things um, isn't going to, you know, that you are going to be able to get through that and actually find more meaning and more purpose and more connection um, potentially by doing so than by like sort of holding it back. Um, and I think finally, it's about being able to imagine the kind of futures we want to create. And that's something again, um, you know, ultimately we just need action from leaders and it is, uh, you know, but if if people can't see what that future could look like without fossil fuels and the sort of multiple benefits of that, then maybe they're also less likely to um, be able to like push for like this is the type of change that we want to see and this is why. So um, I think again, it's a it's a huge question. It's a huge range of things, but I think being able to hold space for the very understandable and difficult emotions while providing that support and that opportunity um, to create hope and to show that to people who are uh, maybe feeling like there's no way in to this for them. And so they're trying to sort of hold it hold it at bay what, what is really happening. Um, but yeah, I'll pass back to you, Mala. Thank you, Emma. Um, John, we're nearly out of time. So I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds to add the, the Philippines perspective onto this, please. I just I just want to add on the climate denial idea, and we're, we're you know these are basically psychological, and we're seeing the climate denial is associated with political ideology, sometimes to an extreme extent, religious ideologies, and etc. In the context of the Philippines, one important aspect is climate education, and right now we don't know whether climate education is actually paralyzing the youth or actually encouraging the youth to engage in climate action. So that's. Uh, an, an area for the research for us and hopefully we could understand that further thank you that's a really interesting point and it links well with with the with a comment and question here uh, there are not enough therapists to deal with the current or approaching influx of young people needing help or that kind of education and um, is there a strategy to address this um I am guessing not. And, and, and so, you know, it's a bit of a struggle and that needs to be a further layer of what needs to happen. More uh, trained professionals getting involved in this, in this cause. So unfortunately we have run out of time for further questions, but before we close, I just wanted to say a very big thank you to our authors and panelists, my colleagues on the editorial group, Emma, Richard uh, and Neil, who came together without them, uh, the special issue would not even have happened. A big thank you to our reviewers who so generously gave their time to critique the papers. And of course, uh, our the tireless support we've had from our own Imperial College events, programs, and IT experts 
uh, Jack Stewart and Victoria Murphy and many others who have helped to organize this webinar today. In closing, I'd just like to request you all please to read the papers, share the messages, and most importantly, please step up your contribution to climate action. It is the best way for us all to feel hopeful uh, and, and remain connected in the future. So I thank you all very much for attending the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.